Our next speaker is uh, Hunter Lesser. <clears throat> He's an author, interpreter, and preservationist. He's the author of many books and articles on the Civil War, including Rebel at the Gate, Lee and McClellan on the Front Line of a Nation Divided, and also the First Campaign, A Guide to the Civil War in the Mountain State of West Virginia, 1861. He has both books available over here. Today he is presenting The Crooked Road to Freedom, Strange Tales of Slavery and Emancipation. Please join me in welcoming Hunter Lesser. Yeah, I like to move around a little bit. I'm gonna ad lib for a minute, we've got time. Uh, it's kind of ironic that I followed, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Rick Armstrong's fine talk because uh, Rick and I go back a little ways. Rick, uh, in fact, is responsible for the one day in my life I spent in jail. <clears throat> and some of you may not know that Rick was, uh, <clears throat> was a deputy sheriff in Bath County, Virginia. And uh, I was over there one day to do some research. Rick, has, Rick is a wonderful researcher. And he had, this is before you know, everything was online, Rick has large files of photocopies of research from archives around the country. And he very graciously, generously offered for me to use them. So I came over for the day, and I ended up in the only place you could work where there was any quiet there, Bath County uh, Courthouse, the holding cell. I was there for a day looking through the bars at Rick. <laughs> Thank you for that. He was my most, most incorrigible person. Yeah. <laughs> Um, let's see, I, have, I do not yet have any dirt on Dr. Annalini, but wait on that one. Terry Lowry, however, is a different story. Um, Terry and I go back a ways, too, and uh, this is good family, family entertainment, so I'll try to do it in that spirit, but uh, let's see. Terry and I did a book signing once at, uh, right here in Charleston at the, uh, at the mall. And, uh, these two young teenage girls, young teenage girls, came forward, and they were really interested in, in us for some reason. I think they thought we were celebrities. I think, I think Terry told them that he had played in a rock and roll band, which is true. So anyway, next thing I know, the two girls, and I'm not making this up, pulled their tops up, and they wanted us to autograph their bellies. And so, Chivalry took over at that point, and we autographed their forearms instead, told them that their mothers would thank us. <laughs> okay. Uh, this talk actually is a little more serious. It's about slavery. And I recognize that I'm really treading on thin ground here, thin ice, um, because uh, I'm not an African American, at least as far as I know. And in today's hyper-politicized world, I could be charged with uh, cultural appropriation. And so I tell you that right now, in case anybody gets fired up about it, please hold critical comments, rotten tomatoes, whatever, till the end of it, if you will. Uh, it's a different aspect of slavery I'll be talking about today. Um, and I, I do have some bona fides. I've always been, I've always been captivated, I guess, by the story of slavery and the struggle of slaves. Uh, I went to school in the South, and uh, I saw the tail end of uh, Jim Crow, and the KKK was still active at that time as well. So it was a real education for me who grew up here in the hills of West Virginia and had not been exposed to that in any, <clears throat> any degree, really. Um, I was fortunate enough out of school, I studied archaeology, I was for fortunate enough to uh, one of my first, actually it was my first field project. Uh, paid field project out of school, worked for a consulting company out of Georgia, and we excavated the slave quarters in two uh, French Huguenot rice plantations in colonial South Carolina, just north of the other Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, we, we, uh, we learned some interesting things there. It was pioneering what they called, I think what they still call, the archaeology of slavery. And some of it was rather shocking but the archeological evidence compared to the historical evidence that we knew at that time. So those are my bona fides for interest in this. Anyway, so here we go. It's a, it's a sad and shameful tale, unrivaled in its history. 
that built America and then almost destroyed it. And yet, slavery is so often misunderstood. It seems foolish, to me anyway, to point the barrel of blame because the firing squad would be circular. So let's take a fresh look at slavery and enslaved people on the long and crooked road to freedom. African Americans have no monopoly on slavery. In fact, the word slave is derived from Slav, for white-skinned Slavic people who were enslaved in Europe during the Middle Ages. By the 17th century, slave ships traveled the west coast of Africa, trading trinkets for human flesh. African leaders, tribal leaders, merchants, and middlemen sold their own people into slavery. Packed tightly into the holds of ships, those people uh, suffered, untold numbers of those people died during the horrific middle passage from across the Atlantic to the New World. The story of slavery in British North America begins in 1619 when Dutch traders brought 20 Africans to the Jamestown colony in Virginia. You probably have heard about it because this is the 400th anniversary of that event. What you probably haven't heard, likely haven't heard, is that the first African legally declared a slave in Virginia was owned by Anthony Johnson, a free black man. By the time of the revolution, there were some 350,000 slaves in Virginia. I'm sorry, 350,000 slaves had been brought to America. Slavery was legal in all 13 colonies. Massachusetts was the first to adopt it. And by 1700, nearly half the households in New York City owned slaves. Slavery was written into the Constitution, but not by name. Slaves were considered chattels, a form of personal property, and they were counted as three-fifths of a person for purposes of taxation and representation which gave slave owners considerable power. Children born of slave mothers were themselves considered slaves, so it was self-perpetuating. By 1808, America outlawed, outlawed the importation of slaves. Uh, there was growing fear, there was much fear about the growing African population. And over the next two decades, most of the northern states abolished slavery entirely. But the die was cast. Cotton was king. Growing international uh, demand for cotton increased the demand for slave labor across the southern states where cotton was grown. Slave ownership became, became a sign of wealth and status. White planters owned slaves. Free blacks, and there were a considerable number, owned slaves. Even Native Americans owned slaves. Believe it or not, there was a slave uprising against the Cherokee Nation after the Trail of Tears. Fear of these uprisings, and we can't appreciate the great fear in the white population about slave uprisings in the 19th century. It was a constant fear. And uh, one terrible example was Nat Turner's rebellion in 19, 1831, where uh, uh, runaway slaves killed between 50 and 60 whites in Southampton County, Virginia. In retaliation, more than 100 slaves and free blacks were murdered by whites, many of them innocent. And so slave codes were established to keep the Africans in their place. Slaves weren't allowed to, it was illegal to teach slaves to read and write, read or write. Uh, slaves were not allowed to possess firearms. They were not even allowed to travel without a pass. In fact, they couldn't even gather for religious services without a white preacher present. They might be planning something else. Free blacks, and, and uh, there were thousands of them in Virginia, were encouraged to leave the state entirely. They were poor role models for slavery. Of course, the slaves resisted at every opportunity. They wanted to be free. <clears throat> the resistance took many forms. They could refuse to work. They would burn the master's barn or destroy agricultural or industrial equipment. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
uh, slaves were deported from the state, sometimes even murdered. The, uh, the county courthouse records are filled with accounts of uh, punishment of slaves. Just one example, uh, in the Randolph County, the old Randolph County Courthouse at Beverly, um, now West Virginia, a slave was found guilty of theft and uh, he was given 60 lashes and his hand burned severely in the presence of the court. Of course, the ultimate form of resistance was simply to run away. <clears throat> As many slaves did run away to freedom. And we all, we all are familiar with stories of the Underground Railroad. <clears throat> Wonderful stories. And there are various routes that have been traced that slaves took uh, to gain freedom. I'm not going to go over that tonight. I will offer a caution, though. As many of the popular stories of the Underground Railroad are probably lie somewhere between fact and fiction. Even in its day, the Underground Railroad was exaggerated by slave owners and by participants. My caution is mainly because too often the stories we hear today highlight the role of whites at the expense of the real heroes, the runaway slaves. Uh, a few examples. Frederick Douglass, who uh, dressed himself as a free white sailor and took the actual railroad from Baltimore to Philadelphia, to freedom. Douglas is one of the most amazing figures, I believe, in American history. Born a slave, he became a counselor for presidents. I encourage you to learn more about him. There are a number of good biographies, and he actually wrote several autobiographies as well. Henry Box Brown mailed himself to freedom, courtesy of Adams Express Company. Uh, Brown had himself boxed up by uh, comrades in a two by three foot box and he was shipped from Richmond, Virginia to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, a trip that took reportedly about 30 hours. The box was marked this side up, but Brown spent a considerable amount of time upside down. Can you imagine what that trip must have been like? A uh, slave named Abraham, we don't have a, a last name. Um, was digging a trench, digging, actually digging a mine for the Confederates during the siege of Vicksburg in 1863 when he was thrown skyward by a huge explosion. It actually threw him through the sky and he landed, Abraham landed, behind the Union lines, literally blown to freedom. Uh, it seems like a far-fetched tale, but it was witnessed by hundreds and written about by no less than U.S. Grant. Uh, he was a bit hurt, but uh, survived. Benevolent slavery was a myth. It's true that domestic servants were usually treated better than field hands. In fact, based on records and letters, uh, some of them were treated like members of the family. And uh, for good reason, uh, because some of them were members of the family from sex abuse by their masters. Keep in mind that slave marriages were not recognized by the law. Slave families were split up and sold at will. Abolitionists waged war against the slave power. Uh, they formed the American Colonization Society, an effort to actually return the slaves to Africa. In fact, uh, Liberia, the country of Liberia and West Africa, was formed for that purpose. <clears throat> and uh, several, several thousand slaves were repatriated, I guess you'd call it, to Africa, including some from West Virginia, mostly in the eastern panhandle. Um, of course, to Southerners, this was a direct threat to their way of life. So abolitionist newspapers were banned in the South, including William Lloyd Garrison's uh, the newspaper, The Liberator. Uh, closer to home, a Clarksburg court tried newsman Horace Greeley in abstentia for publishing, quote, an incendiary document. Does anybody know what it was? the New York Tribune, I think the nation's largest newspaper at that time. Uh, some other uh, abolitionists, famous abolitionists, of course, Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, a book that Abraham Lincoln claimed started the Civil War. Her brother, Reverend Henry Beecher, a uh, staunch abolitionist, and of course, Harriet Tubber Tubman, 
and Sojourner Truth were heroes on the Underground Railroad, and of course, Frederick Douglass. But slavery remained a ticking time bomb. All efforts at political compromise failed. Money was the reason. The slave trade was incredibly lucrative. Slaves were not only bought and sold, they were rented, leased, mortgaged, and insured. A healthy female slave could be worth $1,000, strong male, even more. Uh, that would be the equivalent, at least, of $30,000 in today's money. So it's no wonder that only about 25% of Southern families could even afford to own slaves. By recent accounting, up to 70% of America's gross domestic product in 1860 was linked to slavery. 70%. You couldn't just will that away. Abolition of slavery would have affected every part of the economy, from banking to world trade. By 1860, uh, there were about four, four million slaves in America. Virginia was the largest slaveholding state with uh, just shy of half a million slaves. Uh, but only about 5% of those half million slaves lived in the counties that would soon become West Virginia. Uh, you'll notice uh, clusters uh, in the eastern panhandle, more slaves along what would become the West Virginia border on the edge of the Shenandoah Valley, more slaves, and right here in Kanawha, on the Kanawha, uh, in the Kanawha Valley, uh, there were at least 1,500 slaves who worked in the Kanawha salt industry. But overall, most of what became West Virginia was not conducive to slavery. The culture and climate was not conducive. Um, and note that the uh, free states of Ohio and Pennsylvania were near at hand, very tempting for runaways. A Tucker County resident summed up his feelings about slavery in a letter to a prospective merchant when he wrote, and I quote, if you design to employ slave labor, I recommend, I would advise you to go to hell, for slavery is said to flourish best in warm places. <laughs> Nothing outraged Northerners like the Fugitive Slave Act. It was federal law, part of the Compromise of 1850, and it required citizens to assist in the recapture of runaway slaves. Sarah Lucy Bagby was a slave owned by William Goshorn of Wheeling. By the way, Goshorn was the brother-in-law of Union General Benjamin Kelly. <clears throat> In the fall of 1860, Lucy escaped and fled north to Cleveland, where she found work with a jeweler. But Goshorn, her owner, hunted her down and had her arrested by U.S. Marshals under the Fugitive Slave Act. Abolitionists in Cleveland tried to buy Lucy's freedom, but Goshorn wouldn't sell. At Lucy's trial, a federal judge ruled that she must be returned to Goshorn. He didn't want to do it, but it was federal law. And so Lucy Bagby, Sarah Lucy Bagby, was returned to slavery in Wheeling. Two landmark event, events led America to civil war in 1861. Of course, John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry in October 1859, horrified an effort to lead a slave rebellion, horrified Southerners because it was aided, abetted, and funded by Northern abolitionists. The election of President Abraham Lincoln in November 1860 was the last straw for Southerners because Lincoln had pledged to restrict the further spread of slavery in the territories. Somebody asked me a question later about Lincoln the beginning of Lincoln's, Lincoln and the current president, something along that line. Yeah, we'll leave it at that. <clears throat> but strangely, it seems, at least to moderns, um, abolition was not an aim of the Union government when the, or I'm sorry, of the Union army when the Civil War broke out in 1861. In fact, based on their letters at least, few new Union soldiers would support it. On the contrary, during the war's first campaign, right here in Western Virginia, Union General George B. McClellan, the second highest ranking officer in the Union Army, issued a proclamation to the citizens of what was called Western Virginia at that point, 
uh, reassuring them that he wouldn't interfere with their slaves. And this is a quote from McClellan's proclamation as his army crossed the Ohio River and invaded Western Virginia, what would become West Virginia. McClellan, oh, he was Napoleonic flair, so I have to take the pose. Virginians, your homes, your families, and your property, read slaves, are safe under our command, McClellan declared. Notwithstanding all that has been said by the rebels to induce you to believe that our advent among you will be signalized by interference with your slaves, understand one thing clearly. Not only will we abstain from all such interference, but we will, on the contrary, with an iron hand, crush any attempted insurrection on their part. Think of it. This is the second ranking officer in the Union Army pledging to protect slavery in Virginia at the beginning of the Civil War. The slaves would have to free themselves. And as Union troops crossed the Ohio, invaded Western Virginia, uh, slaveholders found their chattel property disappearing in rather large numbers. Uh, Confeder I'm sorry, slaves entered the Union lines as contrabands of war, confiscated property, under the first Confiscation Act of August 1st, August 6th, 1861. This was an act that declared them to be rebel property and liable to be confiscated by Union troops. Coincidentally, it was right about that same time that the early Union volunteers, many of which were three-month volunteers, found their enlistments running out, and many of the troops from Ohio, Indiana, and other states returned home with slaves in tow, sometimes disguised in U U.S. Army uniforms. But keep in mind that it was quite, going to be quite a while before sl uh, slaves or free blacks could fight, could enlist and fight in the Union Army. But not all, took, not all took the road to freedom. Slaves that were captured with their Confederate masters after the Battle of Rich Mountain, July 11, 1861, were given a choice, freedom or remain with their masters. All chose to remain with their masters. Union General McClellan witnessed this, and he noted it with great interest. He believed that slavery was their, and I quote, natural condition. But one who did seek freedom was a slave named Ben, who uh, ran away from his Confederate master at Camp Bartow in Pocahontas County in the summer of 1861. Joe Geiger knows this story well. He's written about Ben. <clears throat> uh, ben fled through the wilderness and turned himself in to the Federals on top of Sheep Mountain. Uh, he was in luck. The Union commander at that point was General, U.S. General Robert Milroy, known as the War Eagle. You can see the resemblance. Nobody thought that was funny. <laughs> Milroy happened to be a staunch abolitionist. He took Ben in, gave him a job at headquarters, also gave him a last name. Ben was named Summit for Cheat Mountain Summit, the place where he gained his freedom. And Milroy even trusted Ben to lead a federal scouting party. Later that fall, Milroy uh, sent Ben to his home in Rensselaer, Indiana, where Ben actually lived with Milroy's wife and children, who taught him to read and write, and gave him employment. <clears throat> but Ben could not yet enlist and fight in the Union Army. Meanwhile, General, General Milroy's army marched east across the Alleghenies in April 1862, headed towards the Shenandoah Valley freeing black contrabands as they advanced. The force of the Emancipation Proclamation was still eight months away, but that didn't stop Milroy, the war eagle. Milroy detested slavery. He cursed it. He pledged to do everything in his power to resist it. Members of the U.S. Congress were also cursing slavery in the spring of 1862. They had received the West Virginia uh, statehood bill. Um, West Virginia's uh, Constitutional Convention had not abolished slavery within the, in the new state constitution. Uh, there was an unspoken agreement during this Constitutional Convention that they wouldn't bring it up. So imagine the consternation when an abolitionist, Reverend Gordon Battelle, stood up and proposed that the new state be a free state. 
One delegate recalled that a holy horror was visible throughout the House. So the new state constitution had no provision to abolish slavery. And this is the bill that the U.S. Congress received in the spring of 1862. <clears throat> now the U.S. Congress was, uh, was filled with uh, abolitionists, the so-called radical Republicans, were the abolitionists in Congress. I love that term, radical Republicans. I think I just heard it the other day in a different context. You can laugh. Um, anyway, they, would not, they were not about to create another slave state, obviously. So they created, with the help of U.S. Senator Waitman Willie from West Virginia, they created a new uh, uh, gradual emancipation clause, added it to the West Virginia statehood bill, and rammed it through Congress. And President Lincoln signed that bill only hours before the Emancipation Proclamation went into effect on January 1st, 1863. But uh, Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation uh, offered freedom to slaves, and I quote, only within any state or designated part of a state in rebellion against the United States of America. So West Virginia was not included. Lincoln believed in his heart that slavery was immoral, but he had no constitutional power to abolish it. That lay with the Congress. In fact, many Union troops would not have supported it. Uh, based, I've read over the years, like some other gentlemen and women in this room, I've read probably hundreds of Union and Confederate soldiers' letters, diaries, and at least from my experience, the great majority of them were uh, the most racist of those letters by modern standards were written by Union soldiers, not Confederates. Some have claimed that Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation freed no slaves at all. That's not true. What it did, and Lincoln knew this, was turn Union forces into an army of liberation. And no one understood that better than U.S. General Robert Milroy. <clears throat> On January 1st, New Year's Day, 1863, Milroy's division was on the march uh, towards Winchester, the town of Winchester in the, in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. Milroy halted his troops on the summit of North Mountain, and the general could be seen riding back and forth. There was a blinding snowstorm, and Milroy's face was flush red. His gray, his gray hair blew wildly in the wind as he reined up to the troops and gave this address. Men, don't you know that this is Emancipation Day when all the slaves will be set free? This day, President Lincoln will proclaim the freedom of four million human slaves, the most important event in the history of the world since Christ was born. Our boast that this is a land of liberty has been a flaunting lie. The defeats of our armies in the past we have deserved because we fought to protect and perpetuate the chains of slavery. Hereafter, we will prosecute the war to give liberty to all mankind. Now the Lord God Almighty will fight on our side, and the Union Army will triumph. Three cheers for the proclamation. Hip, hip. Hip, hip. Hip, hip. General Milroy marched his division into Winchester and put the proclamation into action. Milroy posted a broadside titled, Freedom to Slaves. And he watched with great satisfaction the slaves came into his camp and boarded empty supply trains. <clears throat> Those slaves sang joyous hymns of freedom as the trains took them north, north to freedom. All his life, General Robert Milroy remained a fierce defender of liberty, not only for African Americans, but for uh, uh, Native Americans as well. Milroy died in 1890, and the citizens of his hometown, Rensselaer, Indiana, erected a statue of heroic size to his memory. You can see it there today. Ben Summit, the slave, the runaway slave who was befriended by Milroy, was finally allowed to fight for freedom, joined a uh, regiment of what was called United States Colored Troops, USCT, and became a sergeant in the fight for liberty. Jefferson Shields <clears throat> was a slave 
and cook for uh, Confederates of the Stonewall Brigade. Jeff Shields enjoyed his freedom as much as any man, but he remained loyal to the Confederacy. After the war, he attended many Confederate reunions, including, I believe, at least one here in, Clark in Charleston. And he wore badges and ribbons from those events very proudly, as you can see in this picture. Sarah Lucy Bagby was probably the last slave arrested under the Fugitive Slave Act. When Union troops invaded Western Virginia, invaded her hometown of Wheeling uh, in 1861, Lucy was freed when her, jail, when her, her uh, master, William Goshorn, was jailed for disloyalty. That must have been satisfying. Of course, Lucy fled north again, married a Union soldier, and resettled in Cleveland. There at the Cleveland Gray's Armory, she was honored by a rather large, a very large gathering of abolitionists, many of the same citizens who had watched her return to slavery, helplessly watched her return to slavery in 1861. <clears throat> Lucy died in 1906, and she's buried in Cleveland. And as you can see, her headstone reads, unfettered and free. Freedom was gained at last. But the struggle for equality continues to this day. Thank you. Any rotten tomatoes? <laughs> Yeah, I haven't dug into it to any extent. I don't know. Rick, have you looked into that much? I've come across a figure of 200 um, enrollees in the public church. A rather small number. I was surprised. There was a, and I'll, I'll probably dig into this more, um, uh, slaves that were, uh, that were recolonized by the American Colonization Society. I was surprised. There were a surprising number from West Virginia, but they were almost all from the Eastern Panhandle. A few from Randolph County. I don't have names, I just saw numbers. There's a lot more uh, US color troops than those 200. Those 200 oh. are the ones that are officially credited to West Virginia that became part of the 45th US color troops. They were sent to Camp William Penn in Pennsylvania. They were incorporated in that regiment. The regiment was mostly Pennsylvania, so it's known as a Pennsylvania regiment when you look them up. But um, there's a lot of color troops you find uh, information in like the edge of general burial records that are buried throughout West Virginia. There's a lot of them that went over to Kentucky to uh, Camp Nelson to sign up. Uh, we have found some uh, newspaper uh, mentions here and there about uh, uh, people coming through recruiting for northern uh, units like from Massachusetts and others that were picking up troops. One was mentioned in the Canal Valley. I found one the other day where they mentioned uh, over in uh, around Martinsburg uh, a gathering of uh, troops there. So I think that's there's sort of an untold story there. And we're kind of uh, looking into doing some more research on that. So yeah, thanks right. for your question. It's a good one. It's, it's again one of the untold stories that we've more recently. Thanks, Steve. That would be a good uh, talk. Mm -hmm. It's coming. Good. Yeah, <laughs> Camp Nelson was one of those recruiting centers. Camp Nelson, Kentucky, it's a, a new national monument. Um, and uh, a friend of mine, actually, Steve McBride, is the archaeologist there at Camp Nelson. They've, they've done a lot of great work regarding USCT and, and that as a camp of instruction in general. Yeah, can you give us an idea how many uh, runaway slaves made it all the way to Canada and stayed up there? I can't. I cannot. Uh, more than a few. <laughs> Although I, I've seen, of course, the references are often written by Southerners, so you know, there's a bias. They talk about how, how hard life was for some of those slaves in Canada, which it probably was, uh, and uh, that some of them wish they were back, but I don't know if I believe that part. Sorry, I can't tell you, offer more. Do you know the after story for Ben Summit, his career? And, uh, uh, that's something I hope to pursue. Joe, have you dug into that more? It, it got a little tough. 
getting into that. It'll take some time. Sounds like a good one. Yeah, uh, I know there was a controversy with Ben. I think you, you saw that too, uh, but I'm not real clear on it. Ben, before, uh, before he was able to join, he had gone south with, uh, was it Arkansas? No, no, uh, after he was free. I forget. It was they were in Kentucky. It may have been Illinois or Indiana outfit. I can't remember. And there was a threat to re-enslave him. I guess some union officer. Ben didn't have papers, and some union officer was seemed intent or threatened to re-enslave Ben. So Ben fled back to Rensselaer, and then enlisted in the army later. But I've not found much yet. I haven't really been able to dig dig into it. Hope to pursue it. If you don't, Jeff. What do you think about reparations? Oh, I knew somebody would ask that. <laughs> I'll give you my personal opinion. That's all it is. Um, I understand it. Um, I don't see how it could be actually fairly done. And if you dig into the history of slavery, which I tried to, I mean, this was just an overview, obviously for you, a sprinkling, maybe to get some of you interested to do more, like the USCT. Um, I, I don't think it could be done fairly, because so slavery was a worldwide enterprise, American slavery, as I said, and there were international banks involved, Africans enslaved their own people. Uh, you know, there used to be old movies where the whites would land on the beaches and go into the interior and throw nets over the slaves. It, it, it rarely happened that way. Uh, the slaves were sold into slavery by their own people. In fact, just last Saturday in the Wall Street Journal, there's a large article that talks about that very thing, which I thought was timely for me. Um, um, I don't see how it could be fairly done. Uh, my, for instance, should I pay reparations? My, on both sides of my family came over just after the Civil War. So we weren't really responsible for it. Should we pay? Well, if you say, well, you know, slaves, or I'm sorry, African Americans have been, you know, have been, uh, have suffered even after slavery was abolished, obviously, and that we should all pay reparations. I just don't see how it can be done fairly. The other argument, and I, this isn't necessarily my argument, but it's a pretty good one, I think, is that some say that reparations have already been paid, the American Civil War. And if you really know a bit about the history of the war and understand not just the losses in the armies, but the civilian losses and suffering, uh, and I'm not just talking about life and death, I'm talking about property, et cetera, um, that we've already paid for, for the sins of slavery. I mean, that's not my argument, but it's out there. How many, uh, how many blacks are still in what would be considered the Confederate areas and generators? Blacks still in the Confederate areas? Oh, a considerable number. I could I couldn't give you a number. Yeah, considerable number. Remember that they weren't they were only freed in areas where the Union Army had control. And it helped. My point of, of profiling uh, General Milroy was that, and there were others, uh, Fremont, Ben Butler were abolitionists. Um, you know, if you were near one of those generals or general that thought like that, you were more likely to have a chance to get freedom. So, so do you know what happened in the border states in 1865? How were the, the people not covered by the proclamation? How were they? Yeah, it was a long and protracted process. And Reconstruction, we're starting to get into Reconstruction, which is a whole other story. And it's a good one. For if, if you're looking for a new Civil War field of study, if you're a little tired of battles and campaigns and tactics, Reconstruction, which is the follow-up to the war, is a whole new field. And it'll be a real eye-opener. I'm no authority on it. But I can tell you, you'll be surprised at what you find in the different southern states as they were reconstructed. What kind of a support system did the federal government set up like when the slaves escaped, came up the north? Like how would they find jobs? 
kind of organizations Yeah, later, the Freedmen's Bureau was established later to, uh, to provide for that. But earlier on, as contrabands of war, they, they fled to different federal centers. Uh, you talked about Camp Nelson, Fort Monroe, over in eastern Virginia, and other locations where slaves took refuge. They were provided shelter. Sometimes they were provided uh, you know, food and water and, and more. But um, not until war's end well, when the Freedmen's Bureau was established, they were, there were more formal ways for them to, to uh, gain, to, uh, you know, get support. You brought up um, the fact that slave marriages were not recognized and um, the worth of slaves was very high. Throughout your research, did you encounter any cases where self, or I'm sorry, slaves mutilated themselves to diminish that self-worth and try to prevent being sold away from their families? Yeah, yes, and I did really didn't want to, I didn't talk about that. There's a notable case, and I can't remember the, the, it's a female slave who actually killed her children to keep them from being returned to slavery under the Fugitive Slave Act. It's a pretty gruesome story, but the answer is yes, yeah. People, people that wanted freedom would do anything to get it. And she felt that it was better for her children to die than to be returned to slavery. That was her, that was her choice. I hate to end on that one. <laughs> what can you tell us about the Battle of Charleston? The Battle of Charleston? I think there's a, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to leave that to my good friend Terry Lowry. And, uh, I, I would encourage you to ask Terry about his trip to Woodstock as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Well, well, oh, before you leave, we were supposed to remind you about a correlation between oh. the, the very early uh, slide. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I'd rather, I should have stopped with the Woodstock reference. <laughs> um, this is just, this, this caught me, and it, I'm not comparing these two presidents, trust me. And it, I don't want to get into a political debate, but. It really surprised, it shocked me when I looked into, more into uh, the election of Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln in 1861, or 1860, and uh, th there were some parallels between Lincoln and the current president, at least early on, that really surprised me. One of which, of course, the obvious one, is that both were elected by, both were surprise elections. No one expected Lincoln to win, no one expected Donald Trump to win. Lincoln won by virtue of the Electoral College, the split, the great split in American politics in 1860. And of course, Trump also won with a minority of the vote like Lincoln in the Electoral, co electoral College. The other thing that surprised me a little bit uh, was that I did not realize there was such a strong, well, before that, um, Lincoln was considered by many to be beneath the dignity of the presidency. He was an uncouth backwoodsman, uh, some called him his own uh, Secretary of War called him the original gorilla, and others did this. General McClellan, whom I talked about, liked to call him the gorilla. Uh, McClellan and Lincoln knew each other from the railroad days when Lincoln was an attorney uh, for the Illinois Central, I think. Uh, McClellan was a uh, railroad executive, and they sometimes spent time together in lonely county seats when litigation was going on, and Lincoln would spend his homespun yarns and McClellan, who was born a patrician with a silver spoon in his mouth, uh, looked down on Lincoln, as did many. So the other parallel, it seemed to me, was uh, the resistance movement against Lincoln when he took office. There was a very strong resistance movement. You could even find patriotic covers from that period that say, resist, resist, I think the guerrilla or something. And so those parallels struck me, and that's it. I'm not trying to compare the two. The lesson here, at least for me, in that was <clears throat> don't be too hasty to judge history. Uh, things don't always play out the way we think they will. It's, it's impossible to predict what will happen in our current political situation. Just know that we are, uh, <clears throat> that we are uh, I think most everybody here will agree, this country is probably as divided as it has been since the Civil War. And that's not a good thing. I'm not saying 
by any means that there'll be another civil war, but it's a warning for us <clears throat> to find ways to reconcile and come together. And I'll close with that. Thank you.